Nawu Kid is the author of A Life in Killing Field, who wrote about the horror events that took place in his life in Cambodia under the Communist Party of Kampuchea, also known as Khmer Rouge. He survived the mass killing of minority ethnic groups under the brutal tyrant of Pol Pot. But sadly, he lost his parents, sibling, and other family members in the process. He and the rest of his family were captured and enslaved by the Khmer Rouge members. They were severely tortured, starved, and treated in the most inhumane way. They were oppressed, exploited, and held captive. The three expressions associated with slavery. Stripped of one's freedom, owned by another, and forced to work for free. And this is what happened to the Israelites in Egypt. They were kept as slaves under the brutal tyranny of Pharaoh, living in bondage without any hope of a future. God was completely aware of his people's situation and he heard their cry and saw their suffering. It was not Moses' idea to save the Israelites. It was God's. He kept his promises, the covenant he made with their forefather Abraham. And here we see God in action as the deliverer and warrior to deliver his people from oppression, exploitation, and captivity. My first point here is when God offers deliverance to you. Here we see God's presence with his people right from the very start, his active participation, from raising Moses to be their leader, to inflicting the ten plagues on the Egyptians, to guiding them day and night in the form of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. God was with them throughout, protecting them 24-7, so to speak. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 19 tells us that the angel of God was not only in front leading them ahead, but he also moved to the rear to protect them when the Egyptian army was giving chase. He was the large cloud, separating them from the Egyptian, giving light to the Israelite, while the Egyptians were in the dark to prevent them from getting close. Then God sent a strong east wind and parted the sea, making a dry path on the seabed for them to pass through. With a wall on their right and on their left to prevent them from drowning. For the Egyptians who were pursuing them, God caused havoc for them. He took off their chariot wheels so they could not continue chasing them. It was only them. The Egyptians knew that the Lord was on the Israelite side and was fighting against them. The sea walls that allowed the Israelites to cross safely on the dry path suddenly flow back over the Egyptian army and they were drowned when the Lord told Moses to stretch out his arm toward the sea. None of them survived. The Israelites experienced the Lord's deliverance for them. When they saw the Egyptian's body lying dead on the shore, it was then we were told they feared God and put their faith in him and in the Moses, their leader. Here we see our Lord fulfilling his word to Moses in verse 4, that he would gain glory for himself through Pharaoh and all his army, 
and the Egyptian will know that he is Lord. And he, they certainly did. They know who the Lord is. I was told by a fellow seminarian about God's deliverance that took place in a small village in Bakalalang, Sarawak. The tribe living there was were once very fierce hate hunter. They were unruly, violent, and drank excessively, always quarreling amongst each other and plagued with diseases. The British colonial government saw them as a lost cause that soon would disappear from the map on its own. One day, a missionary was invited to the village to share to them about the spiritual revival. He shared his hope that Barkalalang would have a spiritual revival, then an outpouring of the Holy Spirit truly came upon the village, and the villagers were suddenly spiritual awakened. There was no fear for amongst them of what the Holy Spirit did. They stood firm, and God did the rest. Christians who had bad slight suddenly repented and rededicated their life to God. They began to fear the Lord. They chose to follow the Lord. And our Lord delivered this tribe, which was one deep in alcoholism and animistic practices, transformed themselves into a Christ-centered village. People came to commit themselves to Christ and became Christians. It was like a miracle had taken place. The sick were healed, families were reconciled, their farm yields increased, education improved. We have the hope in God's deliverance. Moses was the head to lead the Israelites from the slavery. Christ is the head to lead us from the spiritual slavery that is sin and death. Israel was set free by God's mighty power. We are set free through the redemptive work of Christ. Christ, indeed, is the source of our salvation. Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians explained that the crossing of sea as a baptism for the Israelites. He then used this story to remind the Corinthians Christians not to misuse their freedom and fall back into, into sin. Likewise, we are too reminded not to misuse the freedom Christ has given us and fall to sin again. We came into our Christian's faith, Christian faith through our baptism. We were baptized into Christ, united with him in his death, and buried with him. Through baptism, we have been delivered by Christ from the spiritual slavery of sin and death. We are given a new life through our Lord Jesus Christ. He makes everything new for us. We are given a new beginning. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 tells us, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. The old life refers to worldly values, carnal desires, habits, selfishness, self-righteousness, self-promotion that all need to be put away. This is what we learn in our baptism class. And we relearn them as we journey with Christ. Some of us complete our baptism class a month or two ago. Many of us graduated from the class more than 20 to 30 years ago. We all know this story of the parting of the sea, but how many of us know and appreciate the message of this story? God is the one to deliver us from our sins. We are not to be afraid 
like the Israelites in the crossing of the Red Sea, but to stand firm and see God deliver us. God is our God in action. The second point is put our trust in God. God wanted the Israelites to trust him because they were unable to free themselves from the hands of Pharaoh on their own. They were slaves. They are not trained soldiers. In chapter 14, verse 6 and 7 tells us that the Pharaoh got his war chariots and army ready. He commanded his officer in charge of his 600 best chariots and all his other chariots chase after the Israelites. Egypt then was a great military power. They had the best weapons ready to pursue and capture Israelites. How can the Israelites fight them? We would say Israel is doomed. There was no way for them to escape. Not a single home. That is why in verse 10, when the Israelites saw the Pharaoh coming with his army, they were frightened and complained to Moses, why did he lead them out of Egypt only to die? They rather die as slave in Egypt than in the desert. But Moses assured them in verse 14 that the Lord will fight for them and they won't have to do a thing. All they must do is to put their trust in God and God will him Pharaoh for them. Pharaoh may be the power head of Egypt, but God, our God, is the head of the cosmos. Pharaoh may, Pharaoh may have the best chariots, best horses, and the soldier, but our God is the mighty warrior. No army is equal to him. And to put trust and to trust in God is to have faith in him and to believe that he will bring to pass what he has promised. God promised he will come down and rescue them. And he did. He did exactly that in raising Moses to lead them out of Egypt. God promised that the plates that he brought against Egypt will not harm them. And that was what happened, just as what God had promised them. None of the calamities fell on Goshen where Israelites resided. Talking about trust, I remember a seminary group activity I had to take part in. We were asked to pair up with a, a partner. One was to be blindfolded and the other would act as guide. We had to walk on the road given by the lecturer. Guess what? I was the fortunate one to be blindfolded. I thought it was an easy game. Sure can do. But as soon as I was blindfolded, I felt anxious. I did not know what to do. I did not expect to react in that manner. I had to rely totally on my friend to give me instructions to walk on the road. And she was not allowed to hold my hand. She only can give me oral directions. Once the, the, uh, we started the game, I found myself consistently asking her, where am I now? Do I need to turn? Where are we now? Are we near to the staircase already? Are we? Thank God my friend was very, very, very patient with me and kept her cool. She answered my question as when I asked, not yet, please continue. Yes, move on. In doing so, I was able to calm myself. From the game, you can tell I have an issue trusting my friend to give me directions. It is not easy to place one trust in someone, 
and sometimes we don't even trust ourselves. And more so, how can we trust God whom we cannot see? But God asks us to trust Him. Time and time again, He has shown us that He can be trusted, just like in the Red Sea crossing. We see He is the God who rescue His people, delivering them from the hands of their oppressor, and He is still the same God who can deliver us from our problems and struggles. And all He asks us to do is to put our faith in Him and to trust Him, especially in times of adversity. He tells us not to have any fear but place our trust in Him. I wonder if the Israelite had refused to trust God and ignore Moses' instruction to leave Egypt and moving on. What would Israel's story be today? Maybe an additional telling us that not only were the Egyptians lying dead on the shore, but so were the Israelites who refused to press ahead they were also lying dead too. The parting of sea is seen as deliverance to the Israelites. To the Egyptian, it's a sign of ruin and devastation as their hearts had hardened in refusing to let God's people go. This applies to us as well. If we put our trust in God, He will deliver us from our adversity. We do not want to harden our heart against God, for He loves us and cares for us as we are His people. Certainly, trusting God is not a passive action, but an active one. If we say we trust God, we must earnestly seek Him and allow Him and follow His direction. O B E Y, obey. We must be eager to hear his voice through his words and be committed in him. Trust is not easy, it's a lifelong lesson for every believer. We tend to fall short, stumble often on this, on this make mistakes now and again, yet we must always remember to stand firm up and continue to put our trust in Him. Walking on this dry land is not reserved for those who are about to be baptized or recently baptized. We are continually wanting our Lord to guide us in our life journey on earth. We want Him to walk with us, leading us and protecting us. We need not only put our trust in Him in the beginning of our journey of faith with Him, but we must continue to put our trust in Him throughout our journey on life on earth and to walk the path with unwavering faith, knowing that He who calls us out from the world is faithful. Those who remain faithful will receive the crown of life which God promised to those who loved him. In conclusion, God is not a cruel God, as we tend to claim when we read the Old Testament. He is far from that. The Israelites were his people. He saw them suffer and heard their cries. He offered them deliverance and he executed the delivery. All they had to do was to stand firm, put their trust, and see him deliver them. And he delivers. Let us pray. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory? working wonders. Lord, we give thanks to you in your words in Exodus chapter 14, verse 19 to 31. 
We thank you, Father. In Jesus' most precious name, amen.